Hello, I am Sophie and welcome to my musical analysis of the Bach Cello Suites video series. Today we'll be exploring the prelude of the second suite in D minor. This one is often seen as being rather introverted in character and it has a certain melancholy poignancy about it, which we'll be exploring, trying to understand some of the ways in which Bach is able to create these feelings. So let's jump in. Here you can see another rather traditional harmonic analysis of the opening bars of the second suite. Everything in blue is in our home key, opening key of D minor. And then in red, we have everything in F major, that is our relative major key. And you can see that we actually modulate to F major in the middle of bar four. I'm going to play through this analysis, but everything will be played in root position. So there'll be no inversion chords. So for example, the six, four, three that you see in bar four will just be played as a six, seven. And similarly in bar six, the five, six, five chord will just be played as a five, seven chord. So as such, it would sound like this. Our tonic key of D minor, pulling to a seven fully diminished seven which holds through bar three and resolves in bar four downbeat to back to our tonic. Then we have the seventh added with that C. That's as we go to F major, then a four seven chord. Five seven, three seven, six seven, two seven, five, Seven, six, two, seven, five, seven, and a one. Now in F major. Something that I think stands out to us fairly quickly are the number of seventh chords that are littered across this music. And those seventh chords create a couple of really interesting effects. One is the feeling of being a bit jazzy. So if I play just a couple of those seventh chords on their own, back to back, I've got the seven fully diminished seventh of bar two, going to six, seven, four, seven, five, seven, three, seven, six, seven. And you can really kind of feel that jazzy type feeling, which perhaps isn't often associated with Bach, but definitely is there. Another effect of the seventh chords is of the feeling of stretching the chord or, or pulling the fabric of the music apart. And that, of course, is in the very nature of a seventh chord, where we have the root, the third, the fifth. Those are the scale degrees that we typically expect in a triad, and then adding to that the seventh. So, for example, in bar five, you can hear it especially clearly where you have root position four with the added seventh or in bar seven, for example, where you have root position three, added seventh, and then the next bar, six, seven, added seventh. So we have this feeling of reaching up, perhaps some kind of existential longing. And that actually really brings me nicely to the next slide. Here you can see the primarily ascending arpeggiated movement, which is shown with the pink brackets. So those rising arpeggios in the pink and then counteracted by the descending stepwise motion that's shown with the green lines. So we start with our ascending arpeggiated chord of D minor. Descend by step. Descending by step. Again, same idea. Here we come down with the arpeggio and then further with the descending stepwise motion. Again, ascending with the arpeggio. Here the descent starts to become a little bit more turbulent. And I show you that where the wiggly green line becomes more.
I think another interesting way to analyze these opening bars is to look at the intervallic range covered in each bar. So that means taking the lowest note in the bar and the highest note in the bar and seeing what the interval between those two notes is. So for example, in bar one, the lowest note is a D and the highest note is an A. And that means that our intervallic range is a perfect fifth. Looking ahead to the end of this section in bar 13, we have from the F to what I've given in parentheses, the C, it's another perfect fifth. So this section is really bookmarked by those two perfect fifths. And loosely between those two perfect fifths, we've got a gradually increasing intervallic range leading to bar 11, which is the biggest intervallic range, it's the perfect 11th and really creates the kind of tipping point to a cadence into F major. So if I just play the two notes that create that intervallic range in each bar, we've got a perfect fifth, diminished seventh, perfect octave, another perfect octave, and then major tenth. That same major tenth holds over in bar six, just moves down a whole step in bar seven. We can kind of accept that minor seventh in the middle and go straight on to our minor tenth in bar nine. Minor tenth continues on in bar ten. And then finally, keeping the same A of bar ten in bar eleven, we go up to a D. There's our perfect eleventh, that's the biggest stretch. And then a perfect octave. And finally, a perfect fifth. So seeing these kind of patterns can help us further shape the music. So for example, here we may choose to really lead a bit more to bar 11, knowing that that's where the biggest intervallic range happens. And last, but certainly by no means least, we have a linear analysis which reveals a hidden scale embedded in the fabric of these opening bars. So in that stronger blue color that starts off in D minor, you can see the main structural scale degrees that we have in this scale. And those are one, we're gonna ignore the seven and two, go into bar four and see the seven leading to six, then in bar seven, five, in bar nine, four, Finally, at the very end of the piece, the three. So we had as a structural underpinning. You'll also notice that there are a couple of scale degrees that have been highlighted in a slightly paler blue, uh, and that those are in parentheses. Those are in parentheses for a couple of reasons. The seven two in bars two and three are in parentheses because they really are pitches that just decorate the one. So here's our one, our, our D. And then the C sharp and E on either side of the D just create a decoration to it. And then later the 1 and 2 in bars 11 and 12 are in parentheses because while they're not a part of our main descending line that we've highlighted, they do reinforce the arrival to 3 they're just coming from the opposite direction. So instead of our main descending line that goes five, four, three, they're going one, two, three, again arriving on the three, which is also, of course, one in F major. So there are just a few of the many ways that we can creatively analyze this music and help ourselves to find a pathway through as we choose how to interpret it. And of course, as a performer, when we choose how to perform it, we must be also careful not to overcomplicate it. So it's really important to know what the important factors are, how different ways that we can analyze it, and then choose which of those aspects you wish to highlight and what makes most sense to you. I think that by doing analyses like this, we can really help bring together the more analytical, logical side of music with the more intuitive, feeling-based side and hopefully create more meaning both for ourselves as the performer and also for our audience. Mm -hmm.